from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Stu Miniman. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, and welcome to the first interview of the Cube in our Boston area studio for 2020. And to help me kick it off. Jeremy Daly, who is the host of Serverless Chats as well as uh, runs the Serverless Day Boston. Uh, Jeremy, saw you at reInvent uh, way back in 2019. Uh, and uh, we'd actually had some of the people in the community that were like, hey, I think you guys like actually live and work right near each other. Right. And uh, you're only about 20 minutes uh, away from our office here. So thanks so much for making the long journey here and not having to get on a plane uh, to join us here. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate All right, so uh, you know, as, as Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes says, it's a new decade, but you know, we don't have any base on the moon, we don't have flying cars that right. general people can use, uh, but we do have serverless. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, robot vacuum cleaners. We do have robot so, vacuum cleaners. Uh, which are run Kehoe, by serverless, uh, you as know, a matter a, of fact. A, a, yes. a, a Cube alum uh, on the program would be happy uh, <laughs> that we do get to mention there. So yeah, you know, serverless, uh, the, the, there are things like uh, the iRobot as well as Alexa are some mm -hmm. of the things that people, uh, you know, it's usually when I'm explaining to people what this is and they don't understand it, it's like, oh, you've used Alexa. Well, those are the functions underneath, right. and you think about how these things turn on and off a little bit like that. But maybe you know we, we don't need to get into long ontological discussions or everything. Um, but you know you're uh, a, a serverless hero, uh, so you know give us a little bit what you're hearing from people. You know what uh, what are some of the exciting use cases uh, out there, and uh, you know where, where's where's serverless uh, being used in that maturity today. Yeah, I mean, well, so the funny thing about serverless and the term serverless itself, and, and I do not want to get into a long discussion about this, obviously. Um, I actually wrote a post last year that was called Stop Calling Everything Serverless, because basically people are calling everything serverless. Um, so really what it, what I look at it as is something where it just makes it really easy for developers to abstract away that backend infrastructure and not having to worry about setting up Kubernetes or going through the process of setting up virtual machines and installing software is just a lot of that stuff is kind of handled for you. And I think that has enabled uh, a lot of companies, especially uh, you know, startups is a, is a huge market for serverless, but also enterprises, um, enabled them to give more power to their developers, right? And be able to uh, look at new products that they want to build, new services they, they want to tackle, or even old services that they need to, you know, that may have some stability issues or things like long running ETL tasks and other things like that, that um, they found a way to sort of find the peripheral edges of these of these uh, monolithic applications or these mainframes that they're using and find ways to run very small jobs you know, using functions as a service, something like that. Um, and so I see a lot of that. I think that is a, a big use case you see a lot of larger companies doing. Obviously, people are building full-fledged applications. So yes, the, the web-facing user application, certainly a thing. People are building APIs. You've got API Gateway. They just released the new HTTP API, which makes it even faster. Um, to run those sort of things, this idea of cold starts, you know, in AWS trying to get rid of all of that stuff with the new VPC networking and some of the other things that they're doing there. <clears throat> so you have a lot of those types of applications that people are building as well, but it really runs the gamut. I mean, there are things all across the board that you can do, um, and r pretty much anything you can do with a traditional computing environment, you can do with a serverless computing environment. And obviously that's focusing quite a bit on the functions as a service side of things, which is a very tiny part of serverless. If um, if you look, if you want to look at it, you know, sort of the, the broader picture or the serviceful or managed services, um, you know, type approach. Uh, and and so that's another thing that you see where you used to have companies setting up, you know, MySQL databases and clusters trying to run these things, or even worse, Cassandra rings, right? <laughs> trying to do these things and manage this massive amount of infrastructure just so that they could write a few you know, records to a database and read them back for their application. Um, and that would take months sometimes for them to get it set up and even more time to try to keep running them. And so this, this sort of revolution um, of, of managed services and all these things that we get now, whether that be things like managed Elasticsearch or Elasticsearch Cloud doing that stuff for you, um, Big Table and DynamoDB and managed Cassandra, whatever those things are, uh, are just making it a lot easier for developers to to just say, hey, I need a database, and okay, here it is, and I don't have to worry about the infrastructure at all. So I think you see a lot of people and a lot of companies that are utilizing all of these different services now, and essentially are no longer trying to reinvent the wheel. Right. So uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to Andy Jassy mm -hmm. on an interview at theCUBE, and he said, if I was to build AWS today, I would have built it 
on serverless. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen over the last two or three years or so, uh, Amazon is rebuilding a lot of their servers underneath. It's uh, very interesting to watch that platform changing. Uh, I think it's had some uh, ripple effect dynamics inside the company because Amazon's very well known for their two pizza teams mm -hmm. and therefore all of their products are there. Uh, but I, I think it was actually in a conversation with you, we're talking about in some ways, this new way of building things is uh, you know, a connecting fabric uh, between the various groups inside of Amazon. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I love your viewpoint that you know, we shouldn't just call everything serverless, but in many ways, this is a revolution and a new way of thinking about building things, and therefore, uh, you know, there are some organizational and dynamical changes that happen you know, for an Amazon, but for other people that start using it. Yeah, well, I mean, I actually was having a conversation with uh, Jay uh, Nair, who's one of the uh, uh, the product owners for Lambda, and um, and he was saying to me, he's like, well, how do we sell serverless? Like, how do we tell people, you know, this is what the next way to do things? I said. Just it's the way, right? And and Amazon has realized this. And and part of, of the great thing about dog fooding your own product is that you say, okay, um, I don't like the taste of this bit, so we're going to change it to make it work. Um, and that's what Amazon has continued to do. So they run into limitations with serverless, just like us early adopters run into um, limitations. And they say, well, how do we make it better? How do we fix it? And they've always been really great to it, listening to customers. I complain all the time. There's other people that complain all the time that say, hey, I can't do this. And they say, well, what if we did it this way, and and you know, and out of that you get things like Lambda destinations and all different types of ways. You get Event Bridge. You get different ways um, that you can you can solve those problems, um, and uh, and and that comes out of them using their own services. So I think that's a I think that's a huge uh, you know that's a huge piece of it, um, but that helps enable other teams to you know to get past those barriers as well. Jeremy, I'm going to be really disappointed if in 2020 I don't yeah. see a t-shirt from one of the serverless days with a Mandalorian on it saying, serverless, <laughs> this is the way. Right. So that, great, great, great marketing <laughs> opportunity. And I do love that because it, like some of the other spaces, you know, we're not talking about a point product or a th simple thing we do. It, it, it is more the way of doing things. Right. It's just like I, I think about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, there are lots of products involved here, but you know, this is more of you know, it's, it's a methodology, and it needs to be fully thought of, you know, across the board, um, you know, as, as, as to how you do things. So. Uh, you know, let's let's dig in a little bit. At reInvent, uh, there was you know when I when I went to the the, the serverless gathering, mm -hmm. it was serverless for everyone. Serverless for everyone. Uh, yes. And it was you know, hey, you know, if serverless isn't getting talked. You know, serverless isn't as front and center as some people might think. There, uh, you know, some people on the outside look at this and they say, oh, serverless. You know, those people they have religion and they yeah. go so deep on this. Um, but I thought Tim Wagner had a really good blog post uh, that came out right after reInvent, and what we saw is not only is Amazon changing underneath the way things are done, but it feels that there's this bridging between what's happening in Kubernetes, uh, you see what uh, at, where Fargate is mm -hmm. and Firecracker, um, and serverless, and you know, it, it, it help us squint through that and understand a little bit what you're seeing, what your take was at reInvent, what you like, what were you hoping to see, and you know, how does that whole containerization and Kubernetes wave intersect with yeah. uh, what we're doing in serverless? Yeah, well, I mean, for some reason, people like Kubernetes, right? And I honestly, I'm, uh, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's a great container orchestration system. I think containers are still uh, a very important part of the workloads that we're putting into a cloud. I, I don't know if I would call them cloud native exactly, but um, I think what we're seeing, or at least what I'm seeing that I think Amazon is seeing, is they're saying people are embracing Kubernetes and they're embracing containers. Uh, and whether or not containers are ephemeral or long running, which I read a statistic at some point um, that was something like 63% of containers, so even running on Kubernetes or whatever, um, run for less than 10 minutes, right? So Basically, most computing that's happening now um, is fairly ephemeral, um, and, and as you go up, I think it's 15 minutes or something like that, it's like 70% or 90% or whatever that number is, I totally got that wrong, but um, I think what Amazon is doing is they're trying to basically say, look, we were trying to sell serverless to everyone. We were trying to sell this idea of, look, manage services, manage compute, the idea that we can run um, even containers as close to the metal as possible with something like Fargate, um, which is what Firecracker is all about, being able to run virtual machines, basically, almost you know, right on the metal, right? I mean, it's so close that there's no levels of abstraction um, that, that, that get in the way and slow things down. And even though we're talking about milliseconds or microseconds, it's still, it's still something, and there's efficiencies there. 
Um, but I think what they looked at is they said, look, we are not Apple. We can't kill Flash just because we say we're not going to support it anymore. Um, and I think you actually mentioned this to me in the past where the majority of Kubernetes clusters that were running in the public cloud were running in Amazon anyways. Um, and so you had using virtual machines, which are a great technology, but are 15 years old at this point. Um, you know, even even container containerization, um, there, there's more problems to solve there. But getting to the point where we say, look, you want to take this container, this little bit of code, or this small service, and you want to just run this somewhere. Why are we spinning up virtual containers? Why are we using 15 or 10 year old technology to do that? Um, and and Amazon's just getting smarter about it. So Amazon says, hey, if we can run a Lambda function on Firecracker, and we can run a Fargate, uh, you know, container on Firecracker. Why can't we run, you know, why can't create some pods and run some pods for Kubernetes on that? You know, I mean, they can, they can do that. And so I think for me, I was disappointed at the keynotes because I don't think there was enough serverless talk. But I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to, um, and this is if I put my analyst hat on for a minute, I think they're trying to say, the world is at Kubernetes right now. And it, we need to embrace that in a way that says, we can run your Kubernetes for you a lot more efficiently and without you having to worry about it than if you use Google or if you use some other cloud provider or if you run on-prem, which is, I think, the biggest competitor to Amazon is still on-prem, especially in the enterprise world. So. Um, I see them as saying, look, we're going to focus on Kubernetes, as a, but as a way that we can run it our way. Um, and I think that's why you know, Fargate and Kubernetes, or the F Kubernetes for Fargate, or whatever that new product is, <laughs> it's too many product names at AWS. Um, but I think that's what, what they're trying to do, and I think that was the point of this, is to say, listen, you can run, you can run your Kubernetes, and, and, and Claire um, uh, Liguori, who uh, showed that, that piece at the, the, the uh, keynote, that, the Werner's keynote, that was you know, basically how quickly Fargate can scale up um, Kubernetes, uh, the you know, individual containers of Kubernetes, as opposed to you know, launching new VMs or, or EC2 instances. So I thought that was, was, was really interesting. But that's my overall take, is just that they're embracing that because I think that's where the market is right now, and they just haven't yet been able to sell this idea of serverless, even though you're probably using it with a bunch of things anyways, at least what they would consider serverless. Yeah, um, to depart from a little bit from the serverless for a second, it, Talk about multi-cloud. It was one of the biggest sure. discussions uh, we had in 2019. When I talk to customers that are using Kubernetes, one of the reasons they tell me they're doing it is, well, you know, I love Amazon, I really mm -hmm. like what I'm doing, but if I needed to move something, it makes it easier. Yes, there's some underlying services that I would have to rewrite, and I'm looking at all of those. I've talked to customers that started with Kubernetes somewhere other than Amazon mm -hmm. and moved it to Amazon and they said it did make my life easier to be able to, that, that fundamental, you know, the container piece was mm -hmm. easy to move that piece of it. Um, but, uh, you know, the discussion of multi-cloud gets very convoluted very easily. Uh, most customers, when, when I talk to them, it's I have an application that I run in a cloud. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, there's certain, you know, large financials will choose sure. two of everything because that's the way they've always done things yeah. for regulation. And therefore, they might be running the same application mirrored in, in two different clouds, but mm -hmm. it is not fall the sun. It is not I wake up and I look at the price of things and deploy it to that in, environment. It is a little bit tougher. There's data gravity. There's all these other concerns. Uh, but multi-cloud is just lots of pieces today, right. uh, more than a comprehensive strategy. Uh, the vision that, that I saw is if multi-cloud was to be a successful strategy, it should be more valuable than the sum of its pieces. Mm -hmm. And I don't see many examples of that yet. Yeah. Uh, wh what are you seeing when it comes to multi-cloud, and how does that serverless discussion fit in there? Yeah, I think your point about data gravity is the most important thing. I mean, honestly, compute Compute is commoditized, right? So whether you're running it in a container and that container runs in Fargate or is orchestrated by um, Kubernetes or it runs on its own somewhere or something's happening there, or it's a fast product and it's running, you know, on top of Knative or it's running, um, you know, in a Lambda function or in an, uh, an Azure function or something like that, um, compute itself is fairly commoditized, right? And yes, there are, there's wiring that's required for each individual cloud, um, but even if you were going to move your Kubernetes cluster, like you said, there's rewrites, you have to change the way you do things underneath. So I look at multi-cloud and I, and I think for a large enterprise that has a massive amount of compliance regulations and things like that that they have to deal with, then yeah, maybe that's a strategy that they have to embrace and hopefully they have the money and the, the tech staff to do that. I think the vast majority of companies are going to find that multi-cloud is going to be a completely waste, wasteful and useless exercise that essentially is just going to waste time and money. I mean, it's so hard right now. 
keeping up with everything new that comes out of one cloud, right? Try keeping up with everything new that comes out of three clouds or, or, or more. Um, and, and I think that's, a, I think that's a, something that doesn't make a lot of sense. And I don't think you're going to see um, you know, this, this price gouging like we would see with something, I, probably the wrong term to use, but something we would see, that sort of lock-in that you would see with Oracle or with Microsoft SQL or some of those things where the licensing became an issue. I don't think you're going to see that with with cloud. Um, and so, what what I'm interested in, though, in terms of the term multi cloud, is the fact that for me, multi cloud, really where it would be beneficial or is beneficial, is when we start talking about SaaS vendors. Um, and I look at it and I say, look at um, you know, Oracle has its own cloud and Google has its own cloud and all these other companies have their own cloud, but. So does um, Salesforce when you think about it. So does Twilio. Even though Twilio runs inside AWS, I mean, really, it's I'm using that service, and the AWS piece of it is abstracted. That to me is a third-party service. Stripe is a third-party service. These are multi-cloud, you know, structure or SaaS products that I'm using, um, and I'm going to be integrating with all those different things via APIs like we've done for quite some time now. So um, to me, this idea of multi-cloud is simply going to be. Um, you know, it's about interacting with other products using the right service for the right, um, you know, for the right job. And, uh, and, and if you're duplicating your compute or you're trying to, you know, write database services or something like that, that you can somehow share with multiple clouds, again, I, I don't see there being a huge value except for a very specific group of customers. Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned the term cloud native earlier. Yes. And you need to understand, are you truly being cloud native or are you kind of cloud adjacent? Are you right. leveraging a couple of yeah. things, but you're really, you, you haven't taken advantage of the services and the promise of what the, the, these these cloud options can offer all right Jeremy 2020 we've turned the calendar yes you know what what are you looking at uh, you know you're, you're planning you got serverless conf, uh, conference uh, serverless, serverless days, days Boston, Boston yeah. uh, coming up uh, April 6th in Cambridge. So, so give yeah. us a little view as to kind of your viewpoint for the year, the event itself. Sure. Uh, you've got your podcast. You got a lot going on. Yeah, so. yeah. So my podcast, Serverless Chats. Um, uh, you know, I talk to I talk to people that are in the space. You know, and we usually get really, really technical. So, uh, if you're a serverless geek or you you like that kind of stuff, definitely listen to that. But, um, but yeah, but 2020 for me though, I mean, I, this is where I see uh, what has happened to serverless, and this goes back to sort of my stop calling everything serverless uh, post was this idea that we keep making serverless harder, right? And so, it, as someone who's a serverless purist, I think at this point, I recognize, and it, and it frustrates me that it is so difficult now to, even though we're abstracting away running that infrastructure, we still have to be very aware of what pieces of the infrastructure we're using. We still have to set up the SQS queue. We still have to set up event bridge. We still have to set up the Lambda function and the API gateways. And there's services that make it easier for us, right? Like, so we can use a serverless framework or the SAM framework or ARC, or ARC uh, codes or architect framework. I mean, there's a bunch of these different ones that we can use. Um, but the problem is, is it's still very, very tough to understand how to stitch all this stuff together. So for me, what I think we're going to see in 2020, and I, I, and I know there are hints of this, serverless framework um, just launched their components. Um, there's other companies that are doing similar things in this space. And that's basically creating, I guess what I would call an abstraction as a, abstraction as a service, where it's essentially, it's another layer of abstraction on top of the DSLs like you know, Terraform or, uh, or, or, um, or CloudFormation. Uh, and essentially what it is doing is it's saying, I want to launch an API that does X, Y, Z. And that's the outcome that I want. Um, Understanding all the best practices. Am I supposed to use Lambda des destinations? Do I use DLQs? Like, what what should I throttle it at? Like, what, all these different settings and configurations and knobs. Even though they say there's not a lot of knobs, there's a lot of knobs that you can turn. Um, encapsulating that, all right, and being able to share that so that other people can use it. That in and of itself would be very powerful. But where it becomes even more important, and I think definitely from an enterprise standpoint, is to say, listen, we have a team um, that is working on these serverless components or or abstract abstractions or whatever they are, and I want Team X to be able to use, you know, I want them to be able to launch an API. Well, you've got security concerns, you've got all kinds of um, things around compliance, you have, uh, you know, what are the, what are the, the, um, the vetting process for third party um, libraries, all that kind of stuff. If you could say to Team X, hey, listen, we've got this component or this piece of, of uh, uh, this abstracted piece of code for you that you can take and now you can just launch an API, a serverless API, 
and you don't have to think, you don't have to worry about any of the regulations, you don't have to go to the attorneys, you don't have to do any of that stuff. Um, that is going to be an extremely powerful uh, vehicle for companies to adopt things quickly. So I think if you have teams now that are experimenting with all of these little knobs, um, that gets very confusing, it gets very frustrating. I read articles all the time that come out and I read through it and I'm like, this is all out of date because things have changed so quickly. And so if you have a way that your teams, uh, you know, and, and somebody who stays on top of the learning of this can keep these things up to date, follow the most, you know, the leading practices or the best practices, whatever you want to call them. I think that's going to be a huge, a hugely important step for making it so that teams can adopt serverless more quickly. And I don't think the major cloud vendors are doing anything in this space. I mean, I think Sam is a good idea, but basically Sam is just a sort of a rewrite of the serverless framework. Um, whereas I think that there's a couple of um, companies who are looking at it now saying, how do we take this, you know, whatever, this 1500 line uh, cloud formation template, how do we boil that down into two or three lines of configuration and then a little bit of business logic? Because that's where we really want to get to is just where we're writing business logic. We're nowhere near that right now. There's still a lot of stuff that has to be done around configuration. Um, and, uh, and so even though it's nice to say, hey, we can, uh, we can just write some business logic and all the infrastructure is handled for us, the infrastructure is handled for us if we configure it correctly. Yeah, uh, really reminds me some of the general threads we've been talking about cloud for a number of years yep. is, remember back in the early days, it was cloud was supposed to be you know, inexpensive and easy to use, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, in today's world, it right. is neither of those Correct. things. Yeah. Um, so serverless needs to follow those, those threads. Um, you know, love some of those viewpoints, Jeremy. Uh, I want to give you the final word. Uh, you've got uh, your uh, serverless day, Boston, got your pad podcast, mm -hmm. uh, best, best way to get in touch with you and keep up with all you're doing in 2020. Yeah, so, um, at Jeremy underscore daily on Twitter. Uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter uh, and I, you know, put all my stuff out there. Um, the Serverless Chats podcast, you can just find it at serverlesschats.com or any of the pod catchers that you use. Um, I also publish a newsletter that basically talk about, you know, talks about what I'm talking about now every week called Off by None, um, which is, uh, you know, it collects a bunch of serverless links and, and gives some, uh, um, you know, some I, I opine on, on some of them. Um, so you can go to offbynone.io and, and find that. And then my website is jeremydaily.com. Um, and I blog and keep up to date on all the kind of stuff that I do with serverless there. Awesome. Jeremy, great content. Thanks so much for joining us on theCUBE. Really glad uh, and always love to shine a spotlight here in the Boston area too. Appreciate it. All Thank right. You. I'm Stu Miniman. You can find me on the Twitters. I'm just at Stu, S-T-U. Of course, thecube.net is where all of our videos uh, will be will be at so many events in 2020. Look for me, uh, look for our co-hosts, uh, reach out to us if there's an event that we should be at. And as always, thank you for watching theCUBE.